I'll, I'll probably send you a couple more, another set of problems that have to do with the hardest thing that people were having trouble on. So I'll, I'll probably send that out to you today. It's just the limit of the sum problems that people have trouble. So either I'll send it out to you or I'll send it out to you with a couple of them worked out with you. Because that seems to be the people are asking me questions or the people who, who messed up on the, the, the quiz. Uh, that was where they were having trouble with. And so but in chapter six, we are now going to be doing applications of the integrals, which we already have done applications. We did areas. Okay. That is an application. We did areas under a curve bounded by the x-axis. That would be this area here. We did the last lesson, if you recall, was areas bounded by two different functions. So that area would have been that area. That was where you integrated from A to B. And A to B would be the intersections, most likely on this one. I mean, I could have a different picture where there weren't any, any intersections at all. But uh, in this particular case, that would be my A and that would be my B. I'll call this one F, I'll call this one G. So you'd have to go from A to B of F minus G. That's what you'd be integrating to get between those two curves. All right, so he even mentions here that we have talked about how to do the uh, definite integral on a closed interval. You learned about the limit of Riemann sums. You, you've learned how to do Riemann sums and you learned how to do the limit. Okay, that was Riemann sums just simply if you have a curve and you're finding rectangles. And if you're finding rectangles, if you chose to do, let's see, three rectangles equal width, they don't have to be equal width, but typically if I'm doing right-handed, that's going to go up to the function of that rectangle, up to the function of, I'm on the right side of the rectangle, I'm on the right side of the rectangle. There are my three rectangles that would be approximate, I'm approximating the area under this curve. But since that function is concave up, if you do the right handed, you're going to get a large answer, larger than you want. For the same picture, if I did the three rectangles, but I did the left handed, then I got to go to the left hand of that rectangle. And I'm already touching the function. So I go, there's my rectangle, has an area of zero. I do this one left-handed on the function, go over. That one does not have a zero. If I do this left-handed, I go up, touch the function, go. Since it's concave up, that answer that I'm approximating is an under approximation. It's your smallest answer you're going to get. Whereas this one with the right side, it just depends on your concavity of what you have. Then we learned about the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum. And that's where you had your function and your k was going from one to n. But see, uh, the reason I'm going to infinity was because I'm cutting up my rectangles so small, and I'll zoom in here and try to cut them small. There, look how small they are. Those rectangles are like hair length, hair thickness, you see? So a whole bunch of them. Theoretically, you wouldn't even see any, any room because they're all close together. They're just so many rectangles that it fills it all in nice and pretty. That's when n is going to infinity to that infinity number of rectangles. And that's where we take our function. I'll call it a of k. x really means k because you're gonna have a function. So A of K, and that would be your height of every single of these yellow rectangles. And then we had a, a delta X, which was also based on 
the k going to infinity, okay? So that's the hardest. This is the part that I think I'm gonna send you about 10 problems. I'll work out maybe three of them. And just to remind you guys, the ones we've done, I should have assigned more earlier in the chapter, I guess. Uh, but to be honest with you, it's not on the AP test. Uh, it's only, I mean, very, the concept is on the AP test, but you don't really have to do it the long way on the AP exam, okay? This was in chapter five. We're talking about what was in chapter five. We did area under a curve, area between two curves. We also did, uh, well, now we're, now in chapter six, we're gonna do additional applications. We're gonna do work. I believe that means no, it's fine volumes. That's what that is, volumes. Instead of just area, how about a volume? If you take that area and you spin it around this axis and create a three-dimensional figure, find that volume of that particular solid that you created out in space. You know, as a, as a fan spins really fast, it, it almost looks solid. You know, you can't see it because that blade is going so fast. So picture that it's creating a solid. Uh, arc length is not on the AP test, but it is required by the college to cover. Also, surface areas are not on the AP test. Back to this picture right here. Wouldn't it be lovely if you could figure out how much paint it would require to paint this? Uh, you know what it looks like? Almost looks like a, a bell, like the outer of a bell. If I put like my little, what do they call it, a clapper down here? and it goes back and forth and rings a bell. Well, wouldn't it be nice to know how much paint I'd have to buy to paint that outside of that bell? That would be finding the surface areas of revolutions. You see it's revolving around that axis. Uh, what other applications? You could calculate the work done by a force. We can uh, find the location of a center of mass. Where is the center of mass? Uh, there's just, there's even others aren't even mentioned here. That's this chapter. Chapter six is, is these applications. But six one is crazy. It is so long that there's just no way why the college thinks you can do this in one class period or two. I, unless you were meeting for five hours, a class period, and you met two times, like maybe a summer program, but I don't even think in summer they would teach this, this detailed. So I broke it up into three sections. Part one is what they call this whole section. They call this whole section cross sections, but that's not what's in here. There's more than cross sections. Part one I'll deal with are your perpendicular cross sections. But then there's a part two, which I cut it off. That's where we take, uh, Go back to that one picture I just had over here. If I want to find the volume of this object as it spun around and created this nice, beautiful three dimensions, I could find the volume. And how, how would I find that volume? I would cut this up into like a disc, a disc, cut another disc. Does it look familiar like we cut things in rectangles? I call those discs, I call those hockey pucks because when you look at them, they look like a hockey puck. So we cut them up and this is finding volumes by the disc method. Then I call part three volumes by the washer method. You know what a washer is in hardware, the hardware store? Yes, it's, real, it's circular and it has another hole inside it. It's like a lifesaver, but it's flat. But you can picture them as lifesavers and that's called uh, a washer. And what does that have to do? Is what if that same picture over here what if it wasn't just one function? What if there was another function involved? 
And this blade, this blade went around the circle, around that axis. Look what it would look like. The outer ring would go around and around, round. The outer ring is going around. And that forms this outer ring. Then the inside of that blade goes around and it cuts it out inside. So you see, every time I cut a disc off, let me slice a disc off. And not just for a fact, let me erase everything else just so you can see that one disc. If I cut that disc off, Look what you have. You have you have the outer ring. Oh, wrong color. You have the outer ring going around, and inside you have the circle. So you created a washer. So how in the world did they think I was going to teach cross sections, which I'm coming up to in a minute? disk method and washer method all in one hour not going to happen so here's what the cross sectional areas are if this is not revolving you're just looking at this object sitting on a on a on a bottom of something like bottom of an xy plane and you're you make a slice of the object just sitting there you just cut it out one slice you lay it down and you realize that slice that I caught, these pieces here, if I slice this one off, that's a cross section. So I can cut out another one here, cut another one here, that's another cross section. If you had the power to cut very thin slices, Cut one slice of ham, cut another slice of ham, another slice of ham, another slice of ham. And then some of the ham pieces are getting smaller. And then all of a sudden, some of the ham pieces are getting bigger. You see that? This probably over here is getting a bigger piece than it was right here. And if I laid all those cross sections out, all those cross sections out, and I realized that one of those cross sections, if I want to zoom in on it, here it is, zoomed in that it really has a, a thickness. It really has a thickness that you can't really see with a naked eye. Because when I sliced them really thin, I'm so cheap, I made sure that it was as thin as a piece of paper so I could get more slices out of it. But theoretically, that slice of ham still has a thickness. So this cross-sectional has an area and if you take the area of the base, because each of these are the same all the way down to this piece here, you take the area of this times its thickness, that gives you a volume of one slice. Because you learned a long time ago that a three-dimensional object, volume is always the area of the base times the height. This stood for area, area of the base. That's the height, that's the thickness. So that's what this cross-sectional area is all about. We slice them, we find the cross-sectional area, then we realize it has a thickness, so then we can find the volume of that slice of ham. You add up all the volumes of every piece of ham, you will find out what the volume of the whole ham was. Does that sound exciting? Nobody. No, we're going to find the volume of the whole ham by finding out the volume of one slice. Look at the, even this picture here. This is just a slice of ham, and I'm zoomed in. The slice of ham has a thickness. It has a thickness. I zoomed in, but when I unzoom it, and I put them all together, you can't even tell. You know, if I go together, it looks like you zoom in some more here. Unzoom. It's just one slice of ham, okay? And here's my volume is always the 
cross-sectional area of this ham times its height of that thickness. Same picture, but how was this related to calculus? I know you're dying to hear this. So we're gonna have K number of slices, okay? So the total volume of the ham is the K number of slices of each volume of K. There's your area of each part evaluated, K areas, K slices. You add them up, gives you the volume of the whole ham. In calculus talk, the volume is the summation of every individual volume from K equals one to N. How many slices do I have? The summation, I is one to N, of the cross-sectional areas times their thickness. Let's kick it up a notch. What if those slices were so thin, they were thinner than your hair? the thickness of one hair. If you could cut that ham up into those thin slices, you probably would have, how many slices do you think you'd get out of an average ham? A thousand, 10,000, a million, zillion? If they're so thin, you can't, eat, that when you slice it, you almost can see through it. That means N is approaching infinity. It means a lot of slices of the summation as k goes from one to n of your area, x of k, and here's your thickness, delta x. If delta x is so small, then we can call it dx. And I'm cutting from a to b because your ham starts at a, and ends at b on the x-axis, a to b. Slice, 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 slice. A to B, you're doing a lot of slices. So from A to B, area of each slice times the thickness, which we just call delta X. Because delta X is so small, delta X could be even less than 0.0001 millimeter. That is so small. Of course, it's actually smaller than that when I say dx. And so let's do our first problem here. Oh, no, we're doing more theory. Same thing. That takes us to the definition. This fancy talk that I talked about, the limit of the sum, takes us to the integral from a to b of a of x dx. The steps when we do a problem. Always sketch the solid that we're talking about. Always find a formula for the cross-sectional area. If you're cutting off circles, then find the area of the circle. If you're cutting up into triangle cuts, then find the area of that triangle. If you're cutting off semicircles, which is possible, find the area of the semicircle. Find the limits from where to where are you cutting. Set up the integral and solve it. And so here's your first problem. A pyramid, three meters in height, has a square base, three meters on each side. So the picture looks like this. Square base creating a pyramid. And there's this, in, well, we do a lighter one. We go behind it, oh, front, why do we wanna see it? So you can see there's four sides to this triangle, this pyramid. And it's a square based pyramid. The bottom is a square. Matter of fact, if you sliced the bottom off with a thin cut, I don't want that color. I want that color here. We cut it off, cut that bottom off, cut that bottom off, cut that bottom off, slice it down. I would have this uh, prism here. It would look like this, and then you can't really see the other side. You have that solid. If I slice it, and that is my thickness. That's my dx. That's my thickness. 
And I would have to ask myself, if I cut the next piece off, would it also be a square? Cut the next piece off. Would that also be a square? Yes, it also would be a square piece. You'd have another square piece like this. And, and I could slice the next piece off and, and, and so forth and so forth. And I could have a whole bunch of squares. So the point is this, that this square has, has, has a volume. It's the area of this square times dx. That's the volume of this particular piece. It's the area of the square, which is side by side, side squared, times the height, which is dx, or delta x if it's not super small. So I'm going to take this, because so now I've got to figure out what are my variables, what are my limits. So I'm going to take this uh, xy plane here. I'm going to, I'm going to lay this down on this uh, x, y, z plane. I actually have a, you know, it goes up to z, and this is my y, and this is my x. I'm going to lay this down. I'm going to line up the side of this, uh, this on its face like that. So it's going to look more like this. Here it goes. I'm going to lay it down. And there is my... Uh, now, obviously, it's, it's, I'm looking at it from the top. There's actually, obviously, there's, I could draw it, and I'm not really a good drawer, would look more like that with all four sides, okay? So I'm slicing this up, and imagine here I go, slice, 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 slice. I'm just making some slices, and you're aware that these slices could even be thinner, okay? What's the shape of each slice? Did I talk about over here? What's the shape of each of these slices? Squares. Okay. Those are a bunch of squares that are coming off of here. Okay. Got to figure the bunch of squares coming off. And so when I move down from the, he says something here. Let's see. The cross section, he even says that. The cross section of the pyramid perpendicular to the altitude, which means the height, which means I'm perpendicular. See the squares? are perpendicular to, I'll do imaginary altitude in there. It's, it's the center line that connects to the base. So each of these squares are perpendicular to that. And X is drawn from the vertex is a square. So every time I make a cut and I go X down from the vertex is a square X meters on the side. So if I go down x equals to one, so x equals to one right here, and I cut this off. He's telling me that this square that I just cut off, the bottom of that piece, would have been one by one. He says that right there in the problem. X meters down gives you x on a side. So if it's a square, I went down one and it's a one by one square. If I go down a two, and I do my square that's in here, then that square is bigger, it's a two by two. If I go all the way to the height of this pyramid, he said it was three, remember? If I go all the way to three, then what's the dimensions of the bottom? Three by three. So I know how high, uh, I know what the side is based on which X am I cutting, where am I cutting it at? So the question is, what would be my limits? Where do my squares begin? X equals to what? Three, two, one. What do you think it is right here? That was a two, that was a one. What is this one? Zero. So I start at zero. The height is only three. So that's the last square I'm going to cut off. And every X that I go is the measurement of my square. So I'm gonna go, the area is X squared. And the thickness of every one of these 
is dx. So in about 30 seconds, I'll have the volume of this pyramid only by slicing it in squares. A whole bunch of squares, though. Uh, yes. Well, yeah, I could have drawn it differently. But the way he described it, he said, as I go down the x axis, every x stands for exactly the same as the side of the square. So yeah, if you slid it down, it'd be a little harder. Maybe you'd have to say every x that you slide down, the area of the, of the side of the square is x plus one or x plus two. So you don't have to start, you don't have to start at zero if you don't want to, but that makes it easier. There's a lot of ways to do this problem, okay? So I'm gonna do the work now. That becomes x cubed over three from zero to three. That becomes three cubed over three minus zero cubed over three. That gives me 27 over three, which is nine. And the units were in meters. So since I'm doing volume, I'll do meters cubed. This was a volume of a solid that all I did was slice cross sections off and find the area of each of those cross sections. Find the area of the cross section. The formula has to have the variable x in it so that I can plug it in. I didn't use the word side. I did x. That way I could integrate this function with respect to x. That's why it's dx, because dx stood for the thickness. And there's probably a much better picture than mine. And there's the answer. There's the area of the cross section, x squared. The hardest part sometimes is just is just figuring out ah, there's that, that picture blown up. Beautiful picture. Notice how zero to three was the how far that's that was at x is three. So you go down x distance, then the, each side was x by x. Go down two, it's two by two, go down to three. This was three by three. This part, this problem's a little harder. Okay. No guarantees here because uh, every time I work it out, I go, ah, oh, that's an ugly problem. But I'm going to try to make it simpler this time. First of all, this is a wedge. And he, he describes up here that a wedge comes from a right circular cylinder. And here's how I looked at it if you had a cylinder, and I'm looking at his picture, and I realize that this is actually the diameter of the bottom, because you'll see why in a minute, why I figured that out. So if this is my bottom right here, and it's obvious that he's cutting the wedge, probably most likely, you know, like right to the bottom, right to the mid, the center of it. That's a wedge. And if you cut that wedge out, you'll that wedge would have a curved shape and you would see uh, this piece here and you can see inside it'd be a, a curved thing. It's a wedge and I have to have the other side. So something like to the other side of this, this diameter here. Uh, I'm off still, I'm not a good artist. That's my wedge. And here's what I want you to realize. If we're gonna do a cross sectional, you have to ask yourself, well, how would I cut this to have the same shape every single time? Well, he gave you a hint by this picture, but if you just slice it straight down, straight down, uh, and that doesn't look straight down because it's not 3D, so how, I don't know how I could do it, make it straight down. If I cut it straight down, you're going to have that cut, and then what happens is it's forming a a rectangle this is a better picture because you can see through the floor, right to the bottom of the floor. He cut straight down, he produced a rectangle. If he cut it straight down here, it would also be a rectangle. If he cut it up here, that piece would also be a rectangle. It's just that some of those rectangles are higher than other rectangles because it's slanted, it goes up. So these are all my rectangles, but some are higher than especially that one right there. Now, the trick is, 
if I'm dealing with a rectangle, what is the area formula for a rectangle? Thanks for helping. Length times width. So I'm looking at my rectangle. I need some other information. He says that one plane is perpendicular to the axis of the cylinder. And he says the, the second curve, so what he says, the second curve crosses the fixed plane at a 45 degree angle at the center of the cylinder. So I was right, that is the diameter. And he says that this is cut so that it's 45 degrees, which tells me something. If it's 45 degrees and the side of the rectangle, it doesn't matter where the rectangle is, even if the rectangle was here, it's still 45 degrees. And we know that in a triangle is 45 degrees that I'll do a 45 degree here for you. One, one, square root of two. If this is 45 degrees, these two have to be the same. So if I realize on the xy plane, on the xy plane, if I, if I call this zero with my x, and then my x is going out, then zero doesn't get a rectangle. But if I go all the way to, let's say, a one, if I go to one to the right, these are my x's, then that means if it goes out to one, that means the height of that rectangle has to be one. If I go out to three, then it's gonna be three by three. So the height of that rectangle is three. So what happens is I'll call that height is my width will always be the same value as X. Now the hard part is, well, what is the length? The length of this rectangle. Let me draw this without the picture. If I had a, a circle, and he does tell me that uh, it was a radius of three. Okay, the cylinder was radius of three. So if that radius is three, then the equation of that circle, starting at the center of zero, remember, my x's are going out this way. The equation of this circle is x squared plus y squared equals to the radius squared nine. And if my rectangle is going through, I'm gonna take only half the circle. So I don't need the other half. This is the other half of the circle. I don't need it. So I'm going to erase that other half of the circle. It always closes that off. I don't know why. I don't need that piece. So if I want to find out the length of my rectangle, I have to realize that my length is this piece and this piece of this, of this uh, rectangle coming up. Okay. And so if I cut it off here and say, well, what's this distance right here? That's the same as saying, look at, I got a semicircle and I have a line. I wanna know what the distance is here. Guys, it's the same thing as the area between those two curves. This is Y equals to zero. This is Y equals to, let me solve this, square root of nine minus x squared, if I solve this for y. So this distance right here is the square root of nine minus x squared, that's that distance. But look at, I, the rest of the rectangle is down here, which is identical to this. So this is also nine, the square root of nine minus x squared. So I have two of them. So that's why he's calling you the whole length is, is two times the square root of nine minus X squared. And the height of that rectangle, which is the width of this rectangle is just plain X because whatever X I go out, that's the same height. Whatever X I go out, that's the same height. Now I have my equation for the area. The area has to be length times width, so it's going to be two square roots of nine minus x squared times x. There's my area of the cross section. So now I'm going to go to my integral. The volume is my x starts at the zero. And how far can I go out? I can go out one, 
one foot, two feet, three feet. Can I go four feet? Can I go to four feet? Can that possibly be go to four feet? No, the radius was only three. So my X's start at zero and go to three. Two square roots of nine minus X squared times X. What else do I have to do? DX, the thickness of that piece of wood, that rectangle piece right here, that rectangle piece here has a thickness and it's a DX. It's a DX because perpendicular to this X axis, it's DX. Now, I'm trying to remember, I, don't, I thought it worked out better than that. Well, I think it looks pretty good, but what am I missing here? Well, it looks, the reason I'm, I'm saying it looks kind of hard, I, I remembered being able to integrate it by, by hand. Right now that doesn't, oh yes, it does. Hello. <laughs> I'm having a, a veggie moment. I'm going to change this to U substitution. Volume is, I'm not going to put the limits because I'm changing over to U. U is going to be the inside of the function. 9 minus X squared. DU has to be negative 2X DX. There's my X DX. There's my two. All I'm missing is a negative. If I put the negative here, I have the complete DU. That means I have to put the, the negative out there. So what am I really looking at? I'm looking at a negative of a U to the half DU. I'm not going to put the limits because those have to do with the X's. I'm in U's right now. So let me just do this as an as a indefinite integral. That's going to be negative of a u to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves plus c. I will take this antiderivative, and I'm now going to resubstitute back in the x's. So my volume is now going to be, instead of u, u is 9 minus x squared. So my answer is negative 2, yeah times nine minus x squared raised to the three halves divided by three. I don't go plus C now. I can actually put back my limits from zero to three. Equals to negative two times nine minus three. Three what? Isn't it, is it squared? Yes to the three halves power over three minus two times nine minus zero squared over three. Let's see what that gives me. Equals two. So I put in the, I put in the three first, then I, I lost my power. Hold on, three halves. Okay. What is nine minus three squared? Zero. So zero times a negative two or zero, to the three has power is still zero. That's a zero minus, what is, I'm missing a, ne oh, I'm missing a negative because this was negative, right? So I had a negative out front. I still need a negative out front. There's my minus that separates my two. Okay, minus, minus, what is nine minus zero squared? Nine. That's just a nine. So it's minus two times nine to the three halves over three. How do I do that in my head? Minus minus becomes plus. The square root of nine is three. Three cubed is 27. So it's two times 27 over three. 27 over three is the same as nine. That's two times nine. That equals 18. And did it give me any units in the problem? No, I don't think so. No, he didn't. So 
I'm, to be safe, I'm just going to put uh, 18 cubic units, whatever he was going to use. See how hard this problem really was? Looking at that picture, trying to create the area of that rectangles that are being sliced off. And the hard part was to notice that those are rectangles. I, I put the picture there because I knew for a fact that nobody would see, nobody would believe me unless you saw it. Oh, I'm supposed to do the work here. Uh, 18, he left it just as 18. Look at all the writing he's talked about. It, it really is a tough problem, it was not the easiest. Example three is not really an example. He's just talking, he's just showing off how smart he is about the uh, Calaveri's theorem. Calaveri's theorem is that you have this cylinder and it has a radius. And no matter where you cut this cylinder, the radius is the same. You cut it here, it's still the radius are always the same. And it has a height. So it's very easy to find the volume. Volume is, uh, uh, what was it, of a, of a cylinder. It was the area of the base, pi r squared times the height. There it is. But if by chance you, you're familiar with like a hamster cage or a gerbil tunnel, you can get these tubes that have, it starts at a hole and it's slanted, and then it has a hole that's at the top and it creates another cylinder going that way, and then another cylinder, and then it can go that way and create another cylinder, you know, those tubes that do this. Well, if you had this, doesn't matter how slanted it is, if this cylinder went just as high as this one did, it doesn't matter that it had all these curves in it. The answer for volume is identical to the straight up and down. So a trick question would be to give you this weird cylinder that did this crazy stuff that you said, what the heck, how could it do all that? And then I ask you, what's the volume of that cylinder? You know. What's the volume of this one? And all you really had to do was, as long as the as long as the radius, every single place was always the same, always the same, then all you do is need your height and you can still do volume is pi r squared times the height. It doesn't change. To me, it's an optical illusion, but Cavalieri discovered it. All right, believe it or not, that was the end of the examples I talked about cross-section. This starts part two, okay? I didn't mean to put this page here because if you go past this till I get to part two here, you'll see that's where I start picking up with the disk method. But let me go back because what I did want to do, there's homework from the book of part one, but I wanted to, I gave a worksheet in here for you. Here's the whole worksheet, okay? Uh, and I want to see if we can get through at least one of those full problems. If not, I got to make a video and send it to you to help you out with some more. Example one says, you can use your calculator. So I might need your help with a calculator. You can give decimal answers as long as you use three decimal places. Find the volume of the solid whose base is bounded by these two curves. What does that mean bounded by these two curves? That means I've got an X plus one. That curve looks like this. Y intercept is one, slope is one. I have a parabola, Y is X squared minus one. So it goes down one. So it goes up and over like that. So the area that's bounded is this area here. That's the floor. That's the floor, because what does he say? He says that the cross sections are perpendicular to the x-axis are, he says, squares. Pretend that's the floor. And out come squares that are perpendicular to the x-axis. So if I was to, here's one of the cuts from here to here. And a square to me sounds like a piece of cheese, okay? So whatever distance that is, there's the other piece of cheese sticking out of there. If I cut the other piece of cheese, that sounds pretty bad, but cut this one this way, then that piece of cheese is bigger. 
if I cut right here, that piece of cheese is smaller. See that? So I have all these pieces of cheese coming out of this floor. Do you understand what the cross section is? What shape are the cross sections? They're all squares. And remember that the area of a square is always side squared. So I look here, how am I going to get how long that side is? How long is it from here to here? And how would I get it? Top function minus bottom function. Top function minus bottom function. Top function minus bottom function. That's the length. So my length of the square has to always be the top function, which is x plus 1, minus the bottom function, which is always x squared minus 1, I believe. Yes. There's the length every single time. Every single time. So really what my piece of cheese looks like, and it does have thickness, by the way, what good would a piece of cheese be if it was paper thin? So the side is always going to be x plus 1 minus, why don't I just, why don't I distribute that minus? x plus 1 minus x squared plus 1. Or you can simplify that to be uh, a negative x squared plus x plus 2. That means this has also got to be a negative x squared plus x plus 2. And the thickness is super small dx. Now, the next biggest question. So I know what my area is. My area is going to be negative x squared plus x plus 2 squared. Do you agree? And the volume is going to be partly negative x squared plus x plus 2 squared dx integrating from two different limits. From what to what? So go to this picture. What would my limits be? Where does the first piece of cheese start at? Tell me when you think it's, it's the x value that I need. Tell me when to stop. Right here? Where does the second piece, the, sec, the last piece of cheese stop? Yeah, you're right, Israel. The intersections. Well, the fastest way to find intersection is to take both equations and set them equal to each other. X plus one set equal to an X squared minus one. Set them equal to each other. You could use your calculator if you wanted to. You could graph them both, find the intersections. I, this is so easy to do by hand, though. I'll move these two things over. So I have 0 equals to x squared minus x minus 2, I believe. Yeah, uh, minus 1, minus 1 gives me minus 2, minus x, yes. So that easily factors into x minus 2 and x plus 1. Set each of them equal to zero, x is two, and x equals to a negative one. So Israel, you're absolutely right. This first one, this first intersection is at a negative one. X equals to a negative one. This intersection is at x equals to two. So you always got to find your limits of integration, and often it's the intersection. So here I go, negative one to two. And... Guys, I could integrate this by hand. I could multiply that out if I wanted to. Negative x squared plus x plus 2. Multiply it by negative x squared plus x plus 2. But I don't really want to do this. Do you want to do this? I don't. So let's pick up our calculator. Let's integrate this with technology because he gave permission. Pick up the calculator and go to y equal, there, there's my function. 
negative x squared plus x plus two. But I think I'll square it right now because that's what the area was. And that's what I'm integrating, right? Come back to the left. And, and I've already done this several times with you guys. Math number nine from negative one to two of the function that I just keyed in. Now, if I forgot to square it, I would have to square it in here right now. But since I already squared it in the other function, all you do is press vars, y vars, pick the y function that I want. I could square it now. If I, if I did square it, I could actually go, no, it won't let me square there. I'd have to, how would I square it? I think I'd have to not square it there. I literally have to go over here and put the X. And then there's this extra space that I need to delete because it tried doing an exponent out front. So let me delete that. All right. So there is my function that I already keyed in. Hit the enter. And what's wrong? Something's still wrong. Oh, there's another spot there. Delete. All right, there it is. That answer is 8.1 uh, cubic units. So I go to my paper and I say is, and, and it, it's perfectly 8.1. So I don't need three decimals. It's perfectly 8.1. Okay. That was A. B says. What about instead of squares, what if they were just rectangles, each with the same height? So for part B, it's the same region, okay? It's exactly the same region. And I'm not gonna play any games. I'm gonna go and draw it again and realize that it's the same region. And by the way, the negative one to two doesn't change. It doesn't change. But the shapes are different now. The shapes that come out are, has a length and has a height of one. Even this big one here has a, a big length, but the height is identical. It's still a one. Even this small one has a length, but the height is still one. So each of these are rectangles with the height always one. But what is the length of this rectangle? Somebody, somebody, please make me proud. Nobody? The same as it was before. Top function minus bottom function. X minus one minus X squared minus one. The same one, it's uh, negative X squared plus X. Was it plus X? Yeah, minus two? Mm, yes. Okay, so I don't really need to say area equals this times one because it's kind of silly. So I can just skip off the one and say the area is a negative x squared plus x minus the one times the one and just pretend it's there. That's my area of the cross sectional, but I have to do the integral. Volume is the integral from negative one to two of this area, negative x squared plus x minus one dx. So the only thing I'm not doing is what? I'm not squaring it. So I go back to my calculator, go back to y equals, and take off that exponent. Yeah, that looks good, doesn't it? Hit enter. Well, go back to my, what am I doing here? Where was I at? I was at y equals. Okay, second quit. There you go. So, same problem. Second. Enter brings me up the same thing. My Y1 has changed now, you see? And I hit enter and I got 4.5. So I go back to my paper and I say volume is, it is exactly 4.5 units 
queued. And so the third one, third one says, everything that pops out now is gonna be an equilateral triangle. How much time do I got? This is gonna, oh, I don't have time. Because 